That was a lot of cars. That's a lot of cars. Hey, howdy, hey, friends and neighbors. Scott Sexton here, and there's a lot going on in the world right now, isn't there? Uh, we've got that virus going around. We've got some economic kind of turmoil happening. Hopefully, we'll get through all of this with minimal difficulties and everything will get back on track as soon as possible, but we want to be prepared. And where I come in is, there's an awful lot of food out here, right? A lot of people are self-quarantined or forcibly quarantined right now. A lot of the grocery stores are having trouble keeping food on the shelves. And a lot of people, they can't go into work and they can't earn money to buy the food if it was on the grocery store shelves. So what I want to let you know is, there's an awful lot of food out here. I mean, there's a lot of food out here. <laughs> and I'm gonna help you identify some of the really common, really healthy plants. Um, I'm gonna help you tell the good ones from the bad ones, make sure we don't get any of the poisonous ones, and I'm gonna help you uh, prepare them so that they don't taste like dirt, so that it's actually good food you're eating. Really healthy food, and a lot of it, believe it or not, a lot of these plants are high calorie foods. <laughs> So let's go ahead, let's go out and find all the plants we can. We'll identify them, we'll harvest some, and we'll make some foods with them. And then you can do the same thing with your family. And um, everything is gonna be fine. <laughs> also, I'm wearing my Compost Your Enemies shirt, so if David the Good ends up watching this, I'm expecting a comment. Hey, David. Here we have a dandelion. And these are excellent foraging foods. They have calories, they have nutrition, they have medicinal value. Really, they're the whole package. And they have some look-alikes, but none of the look-alikes are really dangerous. So this is a really safe one, a really great one to start with. And they're so common in yards and in gardens and fields that you should be able to find some somewhere around you. So see, here's, here's how we can identify it. So there's the happy little yellow flower. <laughs> it's a composite flower with overlapping petals. Now technically, each of these isn't really a petal. Each of these petals is actually its own entire flower, but we don't have to get into that, that aspect right now. So I'm just going to call them petals for now. And the stalk, um, the stalk will not branch, and it doesn't ever have any leaves on the stalk. Also the stalk is hollow, and it'll have a white sap. In fact, every part of the plant has a white sap. And here's the underside. The leaves, um, sorry, the petals are usually flattened off at the end rather than coming down to a point. And um, the leaves grow out of a basal rosette. That means they grow out from one point at the center of the ground in sort of a circle. And again, the leaves won't be growing on the, on the stalk. Each plant may have several stalks, but each stalk will only have one composite bloom. Okay, so the leaves, they're toothed, they're jagged, and they're variable. So some will have narrow uh, little teeth, some will have deep teeth, some are, this one's kind of irregular like this, um, but they're pretty variable. Lots of times the ends, the little points at the end of the leaf will curve back toward the center of the plant. All right, so everything on this is edible and I've got several around here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick several of the flowers. And you wanna pick them when they're nice and open and really happy, those are the best ones. There you go, honey. You don't have to worry about over harvesting dandelions either because they just come back and come back and come back. Don't you little fella? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, here's a happy little dandelion. Let's take a look at the root and see what he's got going on down there. Dandelions have a tap root. It can be split, but uh, more or less carrot-like is what you're looking for. And if you're trying to get this for a, as a survival food, if you want the nutrients, go ahead and get the leaves, get the flowers and all that. And the root has tons of nutrients too. It's real nutrient dense. But if you want calories, you know, as a survival crop, then the root is where it's at. And you can eat anything on this raw or cooked, but cooked, the root will yield you more calories because it has inulin, which is a, a prebiotic. It's good for little gut bacteria um, in your belly. And when you cook it, it breaks down into fructose, which is a sugar that you can digest. Now this is a little guy, so we probably are only gonna get a little root out of here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see that one's split there at the bottom, but it's sort of a carrot-like taproot. Yep, 
and that's really all you need right there. We'll wash that off and we can cut it up, toss it in something eat it, or eat it raw, or make some dandelion coffee and mocha, all kinds of things you can do with this guy right here. Actually, I already have some roots in the house, so what I think I'll do is replant him somewhere where he's going to have a happy life and I can dig him up another time. So when you get your dandelions, lots of recipes you can find online are going to talk about you need a pint or a quart or however many of these things. And the way I like to measure them is I'll go ahead and fill a jar up just with the blossoms as I've picked them off and then that way I know how many I have but then I'll dump them back out and uh, you want to get the green back, the bracts and the, the back, any green on there you want to get that off because it's bitter. And there are different ways to do it. The way that I like to do it is I will roll it between my fingers back and forth and you want to give it a light pressure just enough that it that it breaks apart the inside but not so much that it breaks that green ring around the outside and like anything else when you first do it you're gonna think oh this doesn't work and then it'll be kind of hit or miss but then pretty soon you're gonna have the knack down and uh, it's gonna be real fast and see boom 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 and then I can just pull the little yellow petals they were technically they're not petals but we're just gonna call them petals you can pull the petals off and then you could actually, you could fry these and eat them too, they're edible, um, or toss them in your compost. But then once you have all of these, it'll take up a lot less space, and you can put them in a Ziploc bag and put them in the freezer until you're ready for them. So even if your yard doesn't have as many as you want, over the course of, you know, a week or two, you can have a whole bunch of them. See all that purple out there? Just about all of that is purple dead nettle, and we're gonna go take a look at that in just a second, too. And there's a dog. Now see, that's a pretty busy road right there, so really for safety, we don't wanna be, we don't wanna be harvesting right out by that road. We'd rather stay quite a ways back so that we don't get any of the contamination from the vehicles washing off into the, you know, the, the ditch on either side of the road and getting absorbed by any of the plants around there. That wouldn't be good for us to eat. This lovely thing right here is a red bud tree. They don't stay blooming like this very long. Let's go take a closer look. If you can hear it over the sound of traffic, you can hear the bees as they pollinate this guy. It's finally got warm enough to bring the bees out and they're very excited to see our red bud tree. One of the things you may notice about a redbud tree is that it's not red. They're pink and purple. And also, if you can see the blooms there, they have a pea bloom. There's the banners, wings, and keel of the pea family. Hey, little bee. And that's because this is a member of the pea family. It is a pea tree. My kids like that joke. So. The red bud is a really obvious spring edible. Um, the flowers come out before the leaves. See, we're, we're just starting to get these little leaves and they'll be heart-shaped leaves. The flowers are edible, the leaves are edible, and it's really easy to gather a bunch of them. Now, as the leaves age, they don't become inedible. That is, they don't become toxic, although they will become more bitter and tough. So younger leaves are a lot better. This has a lot to offer us in springtime. Also, don't grab onto a bee uh, because you might get a little surprise. Now the, the uh, blooms are done on this tree and we're to the, uh, the leaves and uh, these are also, you can eat them. Uh, they get bitter as they get older, but you can eat them raw, see they're heart shaped. Or you can use them as uh, wraps for things, like put some meat and rice in there, they're pretty yummy. Here we've got another common yard weed, these are wild onions or wild garlic depending on who you ask. There are several species of these, these are all in the allium group. It's the onion or garlic family. And uh, <laughs> they'll either have these sort of round tubular shaped leaves or else they'll have a flat uh, strap-like leaf. And then they'll have bulbs, which interestingly enough, look like an onion bulb or a garlic bulb. Now these do have some dangerous look-alikes. Fortunately, fortunately, it's real easy to tell them apart. You've just got to give them the smell test bruise the leaf or scratch the bulb and give it a smell and if it smells like an onion or a garlic well there you go you've got the right thing 
this is another real good calorie food. There we go. Look at there. Little onion or garlic bulbs. And you can use them just like the stuff in your store. Taste will vary. Some of these, these are real strong flavored. Some of them are a little more mild. But um, use them just like you would the stuff in the store. And here is curly dock, or yellow dock. It's obviously not yellow, that has to do with the roots. But the leaves, see those are curly. That's why this is curly dock. Dock is a uh, word that just means a plant with, with big leaves, whether or not they're related, like um, burdock. Now I don't, I don't know of a burdock plant that's real close that I can go out and video right now, but burdock is another really good one that you could dig up, and you can, you can eat the roots on that for another real good, uh, a real good calorie plant. Now on this one we can dig up the root, and I will, I'll show it to you, but uh, usually people don't just eat the root, um, at least nobody that I'm aware of. You do use it for, its. it has a really good nutrient content, and it does have a fair amount of calories. Um, it just has some, it has some laxative properties. It's a, usually you do it more medicinally than just for, for fun, for eating. It's a real good liver plant, and liver, liver herbs usually don't taste good. Hitting a rock there. What we're really going to harvest off of this are the leaves. And I used to be a lot more, a lot more down on this plant until recently. I gave it another try, and I was pretty happy with it. Oh, um, right. Let's identify it. So besides the curly big leaves, the leaves are uh, hairless. They have uh, prominent veins. You can, you know, feel the veins bumping around on the underside. And they'll grow in a central rosette. This is actually two or so plants. See, the leaves grow out from one central point there, and it'll make a stem in the summer, and it'll, uh, or it'll make a, you know, more than one stem, and they'll branch out toward the top and have a bunch of little seeds on, and those are edible too. And hey, can I pull this up? Ah, I was a little hopeful. <laughs> it wants to go. Now you'll read about the seeds being a lot of work to to get through, but they're really not that bad. They're real easy to harvest. You just you just run your hand along the stem, and you got a ton of them. Then uh, put them in a oh a food processor or your herb grinder. Just pulse them a few times because you want to get that chaff off of them. You want to break the seeds up too, so you can digest them. And then you can winnow out the chaff from the seed, or you don't even have to. It's not toxic. It's just the chaff isn't isn't digestible. And then you use them, put them in crackers or bread or whatever. That's decent. Hey, little earthworm, you go on back in there. That's that's pretty fair. So, if this one will cooperate, <laughs> we'll see if I can break this root. Well, it should be a real vibrant yellow. This one, it's got a little yellowish tinge, but I think this one's had a little too nice of a life here. Um, when they're real vibrant yellow, that's when you have the really good quality medicinal roots. And um, this one's just not quite. I've I already dug up a lot of my good ones this year. This one uh, was out here in the too cushy of a soil, and it didn't have to work hard to grow. But we're going to take the leaves, and uh, we're going to do some stuff with them. And I'll show you a video of using the uh, the seeds too. Here we've got a blackberry coming up, a little blackberry bramble. 
Now it's too early for it to have blackberries right now, but that'll be a thing that comes out a bit later. But uh, might as well identify them, right? So there are these canes with the recurved thorns. They'll have leaflets in three or maybe five, depending on uh, uh, depending on what you got. And of course, they make blackberries. Now there's nothing dangerous that looks like a blackberry. If it's this thorny vine and it has this blackberry looking thing, you've got something you can eat. Raspberries, same deal. There's another one called a dewberry that maybe not everybody knows about. It's further along the ground. It's not, it doesn't make big brambles like this. It tends to crawl along the ground. And um, let's go take a look at one. Okay, these right here are the dewberries. Dewberries come along a little earlier than blackberries, so they're something you can forage for and harvest earlier in the season. Yeah, look at that. It's already got a bloom right there. See? They're getting started. There's some more trying to go. And um, the way you tell them apart is they lay on the ground first, and then their thorns are a little different. Their thorns are more, uh, more hair-like. Well, here we go. They do have some bigger ones, but it's more wispy and hair-like. They'll still poke you, but uh, the the cane looks fuzzy rather than thorny. Dewberries and blackberries are both a good calorie source, you know, being berries, they're sugary. Um, and just real good, too. Make them into pies, cobbler, all that. I guess we'll call this a bonus one. Um, this is a goji berry plant. Now, goji berries are not something you're going to just stumble upon out in the woods. But if you happen to have one, just so you know, the leaves are also edible, just like the berries. Um, you can pick the leaves off and just eat those. So. There's, there's a bonus one for you. Okay, here we have a few things all together. So let's take a look at what we've got here. One thing, we have these purple dead nettles I was talking about out in the field. They're in the mint family, so they have a square stem. You might be able to see it there. And they have opposite leaves, so the leaves come out on opposite sides. And they'll uh, alternate which side of the stem the leaves come off of. It'll come off this way, and then this way, and then this way. The overall shape's kind of like a Christmas tree, see? Now, this is a pretty big guy. They're right next to this compost bin, and they have some really good soil. So these guys are growing big, but they're not always that big. And uh, they have a nice mint pattern flower. See that kind of tubular flower? That's a mint flower. And that's actually the best part to eat is the little, the little purple flowers. Um, these are not an aromatic mint, so they won't smell minty. So don't get thrown off if they don't have that nice you know, minty aroma. But these are edible, raw or cooked. Just chop them up and throw them in stuff. Um, they may have a little bit of an earthy taste. It's not bad, um, and they can be, oh, not tough, just they have a little more firmness to them. So you may want to cook them first, uh, just for the pleasantness, or chop them up real small. There we go. This is chickweed, and chickweed is so delightful. Looks like it's done flowering. I'm, I'll be sure and get you, oh, no, here's a good flower, okay. So. Chickweed is a cool season plant. It's here in the spring. It'll be here in the fall. And the little pretty flowers, they have five petals, but it'll look like ten. Just if you look real close, they're, they're, um, each petal sort of looks like bunny ears. But, uh, so it has two little, two little ears poking up, but it's really five petals. And um, these are one of my favorite ones in spring. They're usually not this big. They have opposite leaves. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look along the stem, they'll have a little, little bitty line of hairs, just one line of hairs. And after each pair of leaves, it'll change on what side that little line of hairs is on. And that's one real good way to identify them. There are different species, and they don't all have uh, that little line of hair. Some have hairs all over them. If I can... There we go. It has an elastic, uh, an elastic inner core, too. So there's an outer sheath and then a stre stretchy springy inner core and those are good identifiers now the whole thing is edible but as it grows bigger it's that inner core is going to get kind of tough and it's going to get chewy now you can eat it and spit that part out or you can eat it and just swallow it it's not going to hurt you but it's not always the you know the best quality it's not always a fun experience to have chewy food so you can either chop it up real fine um, so that you don't have to worry about those little hairs or just take the the last couple of inches on the growing tips and it won't be so tough there. I'm going to tell you what the best way to fix these. Now you can do a lot of things with them. You can put them in soups, you can put them you can put them on on your sandwiches in place of lettuce. Um, but my favorite thing to do is to make fritters. <laughs> They're not the healthiest thing, but just make a simple batter and just like roll around in the batter and just fry them and put a little uh, uh, powdered sugar on them 
or instead of the powdered sugar, go a different route, put some, uh, put some spicy mustard on there. That's actually a neat way to go. Whew. Look at this. Look at that chickweed. Look how much there is. Growing from this little pot, it's happy chickweed. And then we have a bunch over here and a bunch over here. And um, I think I'm just gonna harvest the whole thing. It'll be stringy being this long and mature, but I, I have some ideas. I may harvest the tips for food. There's a couple of motorcycles. Yep. Five, five or so motorcycles. Yes, very nice, very loud. Very impressive, guys. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I may get the tips for some food things and then I think I've got an idea for uh, just taking it all the way back here. Because uh, these pots are my mom's. They were just in my greenhouse. And when she gets them, she's gonna pull all this stuff out anyway. So it's gonna be okay just to go ahead and harvest the whole thing. With chickweed this big, that's gonna be stringy, but it's this big, you know what you can do is you could just pick the leaves because they're not gonna be stringy and they're gonna taste just fine. And I mean, you'd have a big meal here if you were just plucking leaves off. What are they doing? Mm-hmm. Look at this dead nettle I pulled out of there. Now it's got some chickweed hanging on, but this thing, I've never ever seen one that long. That thing, it's like three feet, <laughs> it was three feet long. It wasn't standing three feet up, it's not strong enough. My goodness, that is ridiculous. Woo! That's crazy. I think rather than make juice, since I have so much of it here, I'll dry this and use it for um, nourishing infusions later on. So we're just gonna dry this now. Oh, that's a suckling, Daddy. That is not a suckling, Daddy. That book. And we got a few things over here. Here's some more of the purple dead nettle, Re recognize that. Now you know what, we're gonna have to go and we're gonna have to find henbit, because it actually looks fairly similar to that, and I want you to know 
that they're both edible even though they look similar. You might think, hey, this one's a little different. Is it okay to it? And, and I want to show you because you can eat both of them. But, um, okay, here's one. This is Cleaver's. This is a real classic one and easy to identify. It has a square stem like the mints do, but it has a whorl of leaves. That means it's just leaves coming out all the way around the stem. And um, it's real easily identifiable because it feels like you're holding Velcro. And it has these little hook-like uh, little hairs that grab on and they'll, they'll grab on to you. You don't even have to harvest them. And they like doing that. They're designed to do that because they'll grab onto your pants leg as you're walking through them and then you carry their seeds off so you're doing them a favor. These are better eaten when they're young because they're more tender. As they get older they get more silica in their body and they get tougher. You can still eat them and in fact you may want to because that silica is good for hair, nails, bones, all, all your connective tissue, your skin. Um, Horsetail is another good plant for that. I guess we can look at some of that in a bit too. Um, everything above ground is edible. Probably the below ground part's edible too, but uh, I never eat any of that. <laughs> if you are going to eat the older ones, what I think the best way to do is dry them, grind them into a powder, and then just add them to something. Because they're kind of hard and chewy at that point. But younger ones, yeah, younger ones, absolutely, you can eat those. Cleavers are really easy to harvest. They'll come right up for you, and they stick to you, so it's real easy to uh, keep a hold of them. But a lot of times they'll grab onto other plants, and that's the trick, is not harvesting extra things with them. Look at that. Boink. You can get a big load of this stuff pretty quick. Ah, but there's some chickweed. Of course, chickweed's not going to hurt anything. And you probably want to get off the, the little dead ends of it. Hello, little elderberry. Yeah, look how much we got. And it all sticks together. Easy. And here is an actual 10 year old about to taste it. I'll drink it. Here is an 8 year old going to taste it. Sweet. Okay, do 5 year olds like it? Go ahead. Go ahead, take a drink. Mmm. Tastes like chickweed. <laughs> it tastes like chickweed. Do four-year-olds like it? All right, take a sip. Do you like it? Yeah, have another <laughs> sip, please. Yes, you can have another sip. Hey, do you want to try some of this? No, thanks. Okay. We also have some wild bergamot. Now, this is not the bergamot that you get in your Earl Grey tea. That's a citrus plant. This is a member of the mint family, square stem, opposite leaves. And you can find this in gardens, and you can find it out in the wild. There's Monarda fistulosa and Monardo, Monarda didyma. But I think you can use them interchangeably. I just use the, uh, the fistulosa. Um, you may notice the leaves have a little purplish tint, especially on the underneath. And they have a real spicy, pungent flavor, uh, quite like oregano. In fact, one of the names for them is wild oregano. Now, in your garden, you'll probably hear it called bee balm, which is another name for it. Um, this would be a plant that you would use as a spice. You wouldn't just eat fistfuls of it. But it's also a really good medicinal plant. It's very antimicrobial. 
Now, I've heard that the Garden Cultivar version, the Bee Balm, isn't as effective like that, uh, isn't quite as powerful of an antimicrobial. I haven't tested that out because I just have the wild one. But um, I suspect that that may have more to do with growing conditions than the variety. I don't know for sure. But, um, you know, if you, you take a medicinal plant and you, you know, you water it and you give it a lot of good fertilizer and it has a really easy life, you know, it can grow really big, but it may not have all the densely packed eff effect, you know, so, so ounce for ounce, it may not have as much medicine in it. So that's, that's my theory about what happens with those, but you can, uh, <laughs> you can take that for what you will. Lemon balm is another member of the mint family that you might find escaped from an herb garden, or you may find it in somebody's herb garden. It's real hardy. Lots of the mints are, and wherever it grows, it likes to it likes to stay there and spread. And this does, in fact, have a nice minty flavor. And um, everything above ground is edible. Usually, it's used in teas. Uh, it does have some antimicrobial action, and it's also got some nice mood lifting, relaxing. Um, medical properties too so that's a nice one that you may want to have just to flavor things up and just to take some of the tension off if you're having a rough day you'll know you have lemon balm because if you smush up the leaf and smell it mmm smells like lemons ah prickly pear now you may have real big prickly pears or you may have kind of small prickly pears but um, if you live in the United States anyway chances are you have prickly pears somewhere Prickly pears can be identified apart from other cactuses because they have a, a teardrop-shaped pad, and that's really all they're made of, just a bunch of, of teardrop-shaped pads connected to each other. And they'll have big spines, they'll have little spines, little glockids, and that's the part you want to watch out for. You don't want to get poked by those. But you can get some tongs to grab onto a pad and use your knife and uh, cut it off from another one. That's a little nicer to the plant than twisting and ripping it off, right? They're real easy to propagate, by the way. You just uh, cut those off and throw them on the ground. That's what I did with that's what I did with these, and they will grow, and you'll have a whole garden of them. Or you run over them with a brush hog, and you'll have a whole bunch of them all over your uh, your pasture land. <laughs> but um, yeah, these we're gonna have to get the spines off before we can eat these. But um, they're another real good edible and medicinal plant. Over here you can see the remnants of the fruit. They'll make an edible fruit. Uh, the flowers, the blooms are edible and the, the fruit are edible and, and pretty sweet, pretty good too. Still, you gotta watch out about those needles. You don't wanna eat the needles. That would, that would just ruin your whole day. Hey, I found one of those hen bits. So, it's like the purple dead nettle. See the basic shape, the flowers? But this one has more of a scalloped leaf and it doesn't make so much of a Christmas tree shape because the leaves are spaced out quite a bit more. You would use it just like you would the purple dead nettle. Um, the flowers are still the best part on it. You know, the purple dead nettle, I didn't mention this, but it has some uh, allergy reducing properties. It helps some people um, with their allergy symptoms. I haven't tried using the hembit for the same thing, but they're closely related and I wouldn't be surprised if it did have a little bit of that tendency in it as well. I've had a couple of stowaways here in my greenhouse with my plants. One of these is wood sorrel or oxalis, and it looks an awful lot like a clover now, doesn't it? Except this has a heart-shaped leaflet, whereas clover will not. It'll have a more of a, a teardrop or a triangular leaflet. It won't have that little cleft in there. And um, they're edible the whole way <laughs> from bottom to top. They have sort of a tart, lemony taste. These will have oxalic acid in them, which can cause problems with some people. Uh, the yellow dock does too, that we saw earlier. So if you have kidney stones or gout, you may want to watch out about eating too many of these. Of course, a lot of our food already has oxalic acid in it. Chocolate does, spinach does, a lot of them do. Even your own body will make oxalic acid. Uh, it's just some people have problems with too much of it. Oh, here's one of the little blooms not open yet, but they'll be yellow. And um, eat that raw or toss it into something. It's good. It's yummy. <laughs> and then right here, buy it. This is a bitter crest. Now this one is in some, it's in some good soil and it's really, really happy. They're not usually this big. We used to call these pop plants because the seeds will be under tension. And when you walk by and brush against them, they'll pchoo, shoot the seeds out. We used to have a lot of fun playing with those as kids. Now this is in the mustard family, and everything in the mustard family is edible. Hooray! They're not all good, but they're all edible. And, um, well, you know, little guy, I'm gonna have to pull you out. This is really somebody else's container anyway. 
because I need to show you to some people. Ooh, pull you out of that hens and chicks there. Those. Okay, so it grows in a basil rosette like so many of the other things have. And it will have... Oh gosh, it's hard to kind of show you. Okay, here's a leaf. There we go. So it has this compound leaf, or the or opposite leaves, rather, um, coming out of these stems. And... Hard to get this oriented. They'll grow in a basil rosette. This is sort of an awkward one to show you, but you can see these leaves. Golly, guy, you think you grew enough? <laughs> they have kind of a spicy, peppery taste. Um, most of the most of the mustards will actually have sort of a peppery taste. And the roots, now there's not a lot going on here in the root department, you can see, but if you wash those off and you want to put them in something, they do have kind of a horseradish flavor, so that's kind of fun. If you don't have any horseradish right there, there's not a lot to it, but you could use that. Here is a bittercress in its natural habitat. Now you can't tell in the picture, um, probably, because those are tiny, tiny flowers. But in the mustard family, the flowers all have four petals, and there are six stamens. Now you may need a magnifying glass, but there are six stamens. Four petals, six stamens. And um, the flowers, uh, the flowers, the uh, the seeds, they grow in what's called a raceme. It's, it's like a spiral staircase. Uh, it's a spiral staircase for little fairies to climb up because they, as they come out around that stem, they go boom, 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 boom around in a in a circle. Called bittercress, but it is not bitter. <laughs> well, doesn't that look an awful lot like the oxalis we just saw, like the wood sorrel? It sure does, but it's not the same thing. This one actually is clover. This is a red clover, which, funnily enough makes a pink bloom. <laughs> we have some, we have clover around here that does make a very red bloom and it's called crimson clover. So names are fun. But it has three leaflets and the uh, these have that little chevron pattern. Now they don't all have the chevron pattern but this kind does. And they're edible, completely edible. The the flowers they make, all the seeds, the leaves, the stems. Um, they're edible raw or cooked but you know what? They're a lot more digestible when they're cooked and if you eat a lot of them raw it can give you a bellyache. So I think cooking is better on these, although it's not necessary, you know, strictly speaking. One of the best ways to get these in is to start replacing some other green with this bit by bit uh, to see how you like it and see how you'll tolerate it. But these actually have a good amount of protein in them, so they're a good protein source. You wouldn't you wouldn't think of leaves as having protein, <laughs> but they do. It's a, they, these are a good nutrient plant. They'll fill you up with what you need. Oh, do you know what this is? This is pokeweed that's just starting to come up. Oh boy, oh boy. Lots of vitamins, lots of nutrients. Also poisonous if you don't do it right. But don't worry. <laughs> we can handle this. Um, you know, you actually eat a lot of poisonous foods. Yeah, cashews. Uh, cashews, they're uh, in the poison ivy family. And if they're not processed, <laughs> they're poisonous too. So don't worry. You already eat a lot of poisonous food. This is not a big deal. Whoa. I've got some pokeweed here. Now, the thing with pokeweed, a lot of people won't eat it once it's past six inches. So, well, let's see. I guess I've got it on here, right? So, that'd be taller than six inches. That one's a lot taller than six inches. But, um, I've eaten this stuff a bunch, and I'm going to go ahead and harvest both of these and be just fine with it. I've harvested it from a lot bigger plants. In fact, some people, um, I've not done this, but I, I know people that have done it, and I'm sure that they've done it. They'll harvest a grown stalk, and I think I think they just peel the outer layer of the stalk off, uh, because otherwise it'd be real fibrous. And then they'll they'll slice the stalk, kind of like okra, and they batter it and fry it and eat it. And um, th this is not pokeweed, and uh, that ought to be poisonous uh, from from what you hear from the plant books but they do it. Now I'm not going to advise you to do that. I advise you to start with the real young ones and the, the real small ones and do all the multiple boilings because um, you know you're just starting out with it and it is a poisonous plant. But I think that the I think that the poisonous reputation of pokeweed is mostly exaggerated especially with the berries. People really panic about the berries and um, the only thing poisonous in the berries is the seed and it's the least poisonous and it's only if you if you break open the seed. You don't digest the seed. It just passes through if you ate them. So uh, if your kid swallows some seeds, 
you're probably going to be fine. I mean, keep an eye on them, but um, probably going to be fine because they probably didn't chew enough to break open any number of the seeds. Chickens are excited over there. But, um, yeah, the root is real. Is you got to be careful with the root. That's where most of it is. Or anything close to the ground. I don't harvest much stuff close to the ground. I'll harvest the top parts of these. If I had an older plant, I would even, uh, if it's not real old, I would just harvest the leaves off of it. Oh, hello, frog. So, I'm going to get these. And, hey, let's get out of the way, babe. I was, he walked right in front of my film, and that's all right, though. Um, I don't, I don't snap and pull them up, because I don't want to get any root. I always cut them off. Because the root, you, you really don't want to mess around with the root. You can use it for medicine, but um, you got to be careful with that stuff. Let's go get a bunch more, and then we'll cook it. Okay, there we go. That's not a whole lot, but it's not bad for this early in the year. Um, notice the real uh, obvious and, and, and three-dimensional veining. You can really feel it. And, um, you know, superficially, these kind of look like a, a, a dock leaf, like a curly dock, but the leaves are not as curly. Sometimes they're a bit curly, sometimes they're not. Also, dock grows in that basil rosette. These leaves grow out along the stem, going up the stem. Listen to a... If I can get that sound. I'm gonna hold it up to the microphone. When I rub them together, it almost sounds like rubbing two pieces of plastic or rubber together, like rubbing two balloons together almost. So there you go. The leaves are kinda kinda shiny-ish, a little, a little semi-gloss. Um, and the stems, the stems will become a little pinky, reddish, purplish, and um, Everybody says that that is the poison. I'm not sure that the purple is the poison. Um, I don't know. Because the root's not purple. Not like that. Ha <laughs> ha. Maple trees. Now when you think maple trees, you probably think maple syrup. And that is something you can do with a maple tree. You don't have to have a sugar maple. Any maple tree will work. Unfortunately, this is the wrong time of year for that. What it is the right time of year for is the little seeds. These are edible. Also, the fresh little leaves coming out. Those are edible. And the little buds. All that's edible. I think these are a lot better when they're green rather than when they're dry. Although you can still get them when they're dry. Uh, they taste kind of like a green pea basically and um, eat them raw or chop them up toss them in something toss them in a stew anything like that um, and when they get dry you can toss them up and watch them fall down like a helicopter too <laughs> hey, look I'm gonna eat one they're juicy they pop look at that eating one I'm not even dying or nothing when they get dry the little the little wing part won't be any good but right now that's fine you know when the leaves get bigger, you can actually batter them and fry them, and they look really cool because it's a maple leaf. They're a pretty tasty little snack. Let's walk over here to another tree that I see, though, that's probably even better than maples, taste-wise, anyway. Here's an elm tree. Elm trees make these seeds, uh, a lot of them make these seeds real early in the year. Um, of course, different species will do it, <coughs> excuse me, at different times. But um, the seeds on all of the elms are edible. Uh, the young leaves, you can eat those too. They'll just get too, they'll get too tough as they get older. But the seeds, they look like these little flying saucers. And they may have a little, like a little notch out of the end of them. The taste will vary tree by tree, but a lot of these are just real good. I like them better green than, than um, dried, but they're just fine dried too. And um, I mean, look at how many of them there are. Look at this. And each of these, I mean, seeds have what the plant needs to start growing a new plant. So they're gonna have some calories in there. They're gonna have a little bit of protein. It's gonna be a good a good nutrient thing. They're also a little bit demulcent because the elm tree is a demulcent soothing tree. So you can get them and you can dry them. You can store them all year and eat them as you need them. Um, the inner bark of the elm tree is also edible and it's a good protein source and it too is demulcent. People always get the, uh, the slippery elm. That's the, the famous one. But you can use any of the elms. Slippery elm is just the easiest to harvest. And it it might be the best emulsant one, but any of them work really well. You know, <laughs> you're not going to get much from a little twiggy twig. Oh, gosh, sorry, something something got me. <laughs> um, but if you can reach another branch, you can you can get this, this outer layer off, and there's a thin inner layer. 
I, uh, excuse me, little Elmo, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can demonstrate on a little, little branch like this. Well, maybe I can, maybe I can. Well, the bark and the, the outer bark and the inner bark are trying to come off together. On these, it'll be the, it'll be the green layer on these growing ones. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get very much. It's a thin layer, and I'm sure not going to get very much off a little tiny, tiny stick like this. But it's a good source of, oh yeah, I can feel it being slippery right here because of that demulcent nature. But grab you up a bunch of these, uh, dry them out, and put them in a jar, and just save them the rest of the year. Use them as you need them. You can grind them up. You can throw them into your oatmeal, or you can throw them into soups and stews. Um, they'll probably thicken it up a little bit because of the demulcent nature. So that's good. Good stuff. Toss them on your salad. Toss them on top of your ice cream. I don't care, man. Just eat them however you want to eat them. They're good. Enjoy it. Good, good calorie source right here. Whenever I take people out in the woods on a plant walk or something, and I want to show them an elm, this is the first one that I look for because this is a really easily identifiable elm. It's called a winged elm. And if you'll look on these stems, you can see that it does have these little wings along the sides. So um, it's, a, it's a really visible characteristic that can, it can catch your eye and let you know you're on the right track. Now, winged elms are not the only trees that have wings. There are some others, like uh, some sweet gums will have wings, and, and there are some more. But at least you know that, um, that you've, you've narrowed the list of what it could be down quite a bit. Then you can you know, look at the leaves and the seeds from there. So there you go. There's a good one to look for, winged elm. Well, look what we found here. This is a plantain. And no, I'm not talking about that banana-looking thing in the supermarket. This is, a, this is a weed plantain. It's the Plantago genus. There are several species, and as far as I can tell, they seem to be all very interchangeable. There probably is one that's better than the others, but basically that you can interchange them. Food purposes and medicine purposes. This is a dual-use plant. Really, they're all dual-use plants. Okay, let's identify what we're looking at here. It has a basal rosette, like a bunch of them have the leaves will have parallel veins and that's going to be a real important identification factor. You know how a lot of leaves will have a branched or a net like veination where they'll go you know they'll, they'll cross each other and they'll go out. This one's like grass. The veins just go parallel to each other and usually the veins in these also are real real tactile. I mean you can you can film there they bump out there and some will have real wide leaves some will have narrow little skinny leaves Lots of times you'll find the wide, leaf, the wide leaf ones in a shady, wet spot of your yard. And you'll find the little narrow, skinny ones out in a dry, sunny field somewhere. But, um, yeah, you can use any of them. Also, they will have a real distinct plantain taste. What does it taste like? Well, you're just going to you're just have to taste them and see. Once you get this correctly identified, give it a taste. And then you'll always know what it is. I always tell people plantains don't have a bad taste. It's just that they have so much of it. Um, so I like to mix them in with other things rather than just taking some leaves and you know shoving it in my mouth and enjoying it. They'll also grow a seed stalk, a long, tough, hardy seed stalk, and it'll have a, a seed spike at the top. But they won't this time of year. This is you know spring. Um, as they get older, the leaves, the the little ribs in here can get kind of tough and chewy, and you may not want to eat those. So you can go through and you can peel these out one at a time, which is kind of a hassle, but it makes for a better quality leaf. Or you can chop, 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 real fine and cut those and then it's not as much of a problem. Now, they also have a medicinal property that is really great, or a few medicinal properties. Um, the main thing they do is they're very drawing. They're really good at that. You can take it and just chew up the leaf and stick it on your hand if you have a cut, if you have a sting or a bite and they're antimicrobial and they will they'll pull out inflammation and they'll actually they'll pull out the venom from the insect or the whatever you know stung you and bit you and it decreases the pain that way um, they'll also stain your teeth i know that because i've used them on a block salivary gland in my mouth the staining goes away it's temporary but for a while you just look pretty bad there yeah and you don't have to chew them up that that's called a spit poultice you you can uh, just mash them up mix them with some water i've actually uh i just picked a whole bunch of these i'm going to make some infused oil with this because it, it's a really handy plant to have around medicinally. But yeah, just whoop, just pick the leaves off and uh, toss them in whatever else you got. It's an easy, ready-to-go type of plant. Um, this is also um, one of the plants that you would use for a, a snake bite. So if you uh, get yourself into a snake bite type of a situation and can't get to a doctor for whatever reason, 
you may want to put a whole lot of this on it you know crush it up or chew it up and stick it on there and you want to eat a good amount of this too and it helps to uh, protect you from the venom's effects um, of course I don't want you to take that as a substitute for uh, medical information I'm not a doctor hey I'm just some guy on the internet right let's go see another plant huh look you here at this river cane this are the bamboo there's a lot of these that are edible now the key to here now these are utility plants you can make a ton of stuff out of these but the edible parts are gonna be the young shoots Whoops. so we're gonna see if we can find one of those well shoot is it too early for shoots what do you think chickens well if we could find one of those those are edible too you're gonna you're gonna peel them and you're gonna boil them and boil them good because some of these can have some cyanogenic uh, chemicals those are chemicals that break down to form cyanide uh, so you wanna you just wanna boil the bejeebers out of them <laughs> and then if they if they taste bitter after that toss them out but if they don't you've you've got a good one huh we may have to come back later on for a follow-up video because I guess we're a little early for this okay I've waited just a little bit and look at all of these little cane shoots that are coming up that's great hey chicken <laughs> um, now the ones that people grow intentionally to eat they have these nice thick shoots that come up and you get a lot of a lot of plant material off of them these by the time we've peeled off the outsides to get to the inside there's not going to be a whole lot but let's go ahead and let's cut some of these and peel them and we'll see if we can make anything out of it um, when they get real tall like you know like that that's uh that's obviously too woody we're not going to eat that but i'm going to take some of these that are thicker uh whoop, there we go some of those a little thicker ones we'll see what we can do with those I'm just and I'm just gonna get my hoary hoary and I'm just gonna uh, cut them off about ground level. Okay, give this a go. Yeah, that the core is what we're after. So we want to peel off this outer layer here. a few of them. Well, they're not endangered. Holly. Okay, that's not a whole lot, but it'll be enough for us to play with. Whoops. To play with what? To play with cooking them. Okay, so um, you could peel and peel and peel, and uh, people that eat these all the time, like in uh, Asian cuisine, I think these are more common, but they have these big fat ones. Uh, they probably know a better way. How I do it is to slice it down the middle. And then you can see the white part is what you want. Oh, this one doesn't have a lot. This one won't give us a lot. Um, usually it'll go further up, but I'll start at the top and just cut down that side and then cut down that side and then peel it. And if there's any extra leaves, just peel them right off. Easy peasy. And that one's ready to go. See, it just takes a few seconds. Uh, here's the other one. One side. The other side, and just peel off the loose stuff. So these wild ones don't normally give you a lot, but they usually do give you more than that. Well guys, after the first bite, I realized that messed up. Should have used Worcestershire sauce. Rookie mistake. Now, if you run out of coffee or tea, this is your substitute. This is a Yopon Holly, and it's our native North American caffeine plant. You may run into these, depending on where you live in North America. You may find them out in the wild, but most likely you're gonna find these in landscaping. These are a really popular landscaping plant. And I'll do the uh, detailed identification in its little profile. But um, yeah, this is your caffeine plant. <laughs> you can use them green or you can roast them. And we're gonna get some of these. We're gonna make a caffeinated drink. Now, the scientific name is Elex Vomitoria. Yes, it is called Vomitoria for a reason, but don't let that scare you. That really has to do with more of a really, really strong decoction of these in a ceremonial thing, not what we're gonna make. So a lot of these plants that I've been talking about, they can be eaten raw or cooked. So the question is, which one is best? 
Well, if you want the live enzymes, if you want the medicinal properties, then raw is best. But if you're talking about getting just the raw nutrients in and um, being able to digest them more easily, then cooked is probably better because it breaks down the cell walls and it makes it easier for your body to pull those out. So raw or cooked, the answer as usual is it depends. Now, the grapes are not starting to leaf out yet, but when they do, and it won't be long, those are also edible. The grape leaves are completely edible, as are grapes. I stand corrected. We have a few little grape leaves starting. See, I knew it would be soon. It happened just the second after I said that, didn't it? Yeah, look, we waited a little bit, and now a lot more have come out. Now we could, we could eat these raw, or we could boil these. Um, when they get a little bigger, you can like parboil them and then wrap them up into dolmas. And I don't really do that enough. I should do that more. Any of the grape leaves, uh, and muscadines are a type of grape, so any type of grape you can do that with. I have just recently divided all of my, well, my, my few aloes into a bunch of aloes because they were needing it. And some of them look a little sad right now, poor things, but I think they'll they'll come back together. And I thought, hey, let's just mention aloes since I've just done this. But um, aloes like hot weather. They will not grow outdoor year outdoors year round here. But if you're in a hot place, yeah, they'll love it outdoors year round. And if not, well, they they grow in a pot real real well. And the the uh, of course everybody uses them for you know sunburns or minor burns the gel on the inside of the of the big succulent leaf but you can also eat the gel the gel's um, good for your uh, digestion actually it's a, a little laxative but not in a bad way now the skin of the leaf the outer skin yeah that is super laxative it's a uh, it's purgative or uh, yeah it's a it's a purgative and uh, don't uh, don't don't eat that. <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, about everybody's quarantined right now, so we're not going anywhere anyway. But um, still, it's probably not a good idea, unless you, you need it for medicinal reasons. Oh, I see my son has come in here, and uh, he loves to come in and eat the inner gel. But yeah, they're real easy to grow. They don't need much water. And we got a friend that says they grow better under fluorescent lights than anything else. So, uh, you know, get you some of those and start them on the kitchen counter. It's medicine and food. Let's talk about yarrow for a minute. Now, just so you know, most people say yarrow. For some reason or another, I really get into the habit of saying yarrow with an ah. Um, so if I slip back and forth, just know that that's not the conventional way of, conventional way of saying it. That's just, that's just me. But yarrow is a good plant. You don't usually just eat it, but I do want to mention it here because it's a great medicinal plant. For one thing, uh, it is really good for stopping bleeding. Um, if you've got a cut and you need to get it stopped, or well, external or internal bleeding, um, you can take it internally and it will help to stop bleeding in the body. Or if you have it topically, you can crush up the leaf. Um, I always, always keep some of this dried around, uh, dried and powdered, and you can just stick it on the leaf. And if you put just a little pressure on that, it turns it off like a switch. Um, it's uh, another good plant for that is shepherd's purse. But um, since we're talking about yarrow right now, let's talk about yarrow. Um, it has fern-like leaves. In fact, you might mistake it for a fern uh, the first time you see it. Now, it, it tends to grow in different areas. Yarrow likes more sunny areas, and ferns usually like the shade. But they do. Uh, I've seen them overlap before. I've seen them in the same place. This time of year, they won't have their really pretty and distinctive flower, but they'll make a, uh, a sort of an umbel flower. And a lot of times you want to be careful with umbels because there are some dangerous uh, umbelet flowers. But um, yarrow, or yarrow, <laughs> it has a real distinctive smell. And if you crush the leaves and smell it, once you get that scent, you will always 100% be able to identify it. It also is a diaphoretic, uh, helping you to um, sweat out infections and such things and um, it does not have the best taste in in a tea but in a hot tea it is really effective for that uh, you can use any of the above ground parts they're very aromatic I think the flowers are probably um, easier for the taste um, I usually use the whole thing but you know I really I really should make a separate batch that's just the flowers so I can get my kids to drink it and probably be a little a little better um, they also have a 
the root especially has a pain-killing property, uh, especially uh, orally in the mouth. Uh, it'll numb you up real good. So here's this. It'll have little fern-like leaves. You need to get it identified and get the smell, and then you can always tell what it is. Or later on, it's going to make this pretty, uh, pretty umble of tiny little flowers. But uh, there's yarrow. Hey, look, it's Shepherd's Purse. We just kind of mentioned this with the yarrow. So Shepherd's Purse is a member of the mustard family. So it has that uh, racine. That's another word that I've gotten. Up. I always say racine, but it's it's uh, ra or racine is the uh, the normal person way of saying it. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it has a racine. And uh, the little the little seeds on it are sort of triangular shaped. They look like a little purse. And it's called a shepherd's purse. Like I, I assume, like a shepherd would have worn. This is another one that's good at stopping bleeding. So you can take these seeds, you can dry them and, and uh, powder them, and you would apply them just like you would for the the yarrow. And uh, yarrow and shepherd's purse are supposed to work in two different ways on how they stop the bleeding. So um, they're complementary to one another. I'm you know. I'm not a biochemist. I, I don't really know if that's really what's going on, but um, supposedly, I think it's the uh, I think the yarrow works by helping the blood vessels to constrict and uh, you know clamp off the blood flow, and the shepherd's purse is supposed to work on the clotting factor. Um, I'm not a you know <laughs> like I say I'm I'm not really a scientist. I I don't really know, but that's how it's supposed to work. Another plant that is not typically used just for food is the mullen here, or lamb's ear. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, other plants that use that that may go by one of those common names, but um, this is a very very soft. It's medicinal and more of a utility plant too. The leaves are very soft. They can be used as toilet paper in an emergency. Uh, I have verified that through experimentation. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and this is a, a plant that's really good for the ears and the lungs. Uh, you might say it has an affinity for those. Now, it's good for other things too, but we're just keeping it simple. So you can make a, a tea with the leaves, and, and you probably want to you want to strain the plant material out because the little bitty fibers can be irritating um, for some people. Not not every it, it wouldn't bother everybody, but you know better safe than sorry. So um, yeah, it's really good for lung congestion and coughs. Uh, it's relaxing to that area. It helps to break up the mucus and the stuff, and it's great for ear infections. Um, I used to only use onion or garlic uh, juice for ear infections, uh, but then I added some mullen into it, and it's e even better, even better. So it's it's a really good uh, a really good one for infused oils for ear infections. Um, the leaves work. The pretty pretty yellow flowers. Those are actually really good um, for all that too. Let me just mention poison ivy, and I want you to to. Hear what I say and don't uh, put words in my mouth. I'm not encouraging you to go out and eat poison ivy um, because some people really shouldn't eat poison ivy. Um, I have eaten some poison ivy, small amounts, and I have known of people that I am certain have also eaten poison ivy. It sounds like a terrible idea, right? <laughs> but the, the idea is that it helps you build up a resistance or it helps your body to just sort of to, to ignore the... Uh, the toxic chemical in there. Uh, and, you know, the summer that I tried this out where I ate it, I, I would just take little bitty pieces off of the young leaves and I put them in capsules so they didn't touch anything in my mouth to provoke a reaction in my mouth and then I would swallow it. And that capsule would, you know, break open and, you know, it was in stomach acids and it was, you know, in my digestive system. And then, so I only absorbed a, a tiny amount of it and that summer, I was uh, hiking through the Ozark Highlands Trail, and uh, for several days, I was through like knee-deep uh, poison ivy. And I was in shorts, and I was in sandals, and that stuff was all over me. And I could not clean it off a adequately because I was just carrying what I had in a backpack, and I didn't—I hadn't brought a you know poison ivy kit, and I didn't have any poison ivy that year. So, I would say anecdotally, for me, it works. But I would also—I would also say that the people that that could use that resistance the most, that are really sensitive to poison ivy, they're probably also the people that shouldn't try to eat it, uh, because you are eating poison ivy, for crying out loud. So, I just wanted to throw that out there. I would, I sure wouldn't eat it as a green, um, but uh, it, that, that, that's a thing. Use, use caution. Use your own very, very good judgment. And don't eat poison ivy just because somebody on the internet tells you that they ate poison ivy. 
Hostas. Everybody loves hostas, especially deer. <laughs> well, uh, there are quite there are quite a few hostas uh, hosta varieties that are confirmed edible. Uh, it's possible that they're all edible, but you know I haven't gone out and eaten every one of them. So uh, you you may want to look up for the variety that you have, or you may want to do a, a little bitty you know test batch. There are some hostas that are grown specifically to be eaten. Um, but uh, well, there you go. Now, I, uh, I just recently transplanted some hostas, and I, I split them up, and I put one underneath my kid's trampoline. Because hostas will grow in, in the shade, and uh, I thought, wouldn't that be neat if I gradually just divided and divided this hosta to where it was covering everything under their trampoline. And so when we wanted to go harvest hostas, we just go crawl under the trampoline and get some, and then I wouldn't have to worry about any grass or anything growing under the trampoline. I wouldn't have to mess with it. It would just be hostas. And I'd like to see the deer get past the fence and get under the trampoline. And then if you scare them, they would jump and they would hit the underside of the trampoline. And I think that would be, that would be worth the price of admission. Here is a really poor, sad example of a, a ground cherry or I think they call them husk tomatoes. Um, it's a lot like a tomatillo, a tomatilla. Um, so they have this little husk, and on the inside is something like a little bitty tomato. Now this is a very sad, very sad, sad example, but it's it's a coming back or coming up from a seed or something. So I'm, I'm gonna try to put it in the yard. But um, keep your eyes open for those in summer. That I guess that's a whole different video, but there's some edibility there. It, it involves cooking, so don't just go, you know, randomly eating them, but just something to keep in mind if you if you know where those grow. They grow along roads or along trails an awful lot, at least around here. These are yuccas, and um, I brought my shovel out here to dig one up, and I just can't do it. They're so beautiful. Well, uh, the thing is, I mean, I guess I do have plenty. I just, I really like them. Um, and these are multi-use plants. I'm gonna, I'll take a leaf off of this. They have, We'll let this vehicle get by, this big truck. They have very strong fibers, and um, maybe I can use this here too. This probably is not gonna be enough. Not gonna be sturdy enough to break them up. Well, okay, let me give a quick demo. You really need to break up the fibers more than this, but, um... It's the hardest day of my life. <laughs> let's pretend. Let's pretend that I did a good job breaking these up. Daddy. Not right now, bud. So what you do, you can... You can fold it over and you can twist it one way. Or let's see, I'm gonna twist it... Twist it this way. And then rotate it over the opposite way. So twist, and then twist it all around. And then you twist these and around. And you keep doing that. And I have not broken up the fibers good enough. You can, like, scrape a rock over it or something to get them all broken up. When you get towards the end, you just uh, get some more fibers and you'll kind of just stick them in here and then twist them all together to weave in. And you can keep it going. And it makes an exceptionally strong a uh, bit of cordage there. I mean, ugh, that could probably hold my weight. It's really strong. Uh, later in the year, these will make a stalk and they'll make a bloom that you can eat. Some people, the bloom will irritate. Um, some, some it don't. It doesn't. They'll make pods that you can bake. And of course, I don't have those here, so I can't demonstrate that. And uh, the root. People will dig up the root and chop it up and use it kind of in, as a as a soap. It has lots of a natural soapy chemical saponins in it and um, and you can do that it works if you put it in in like a little nylon bag or a cloth bag and use it kind of like a scrubby then you can work a lather up for there and the more you cut or crush up the root the better it'll be but I've also used the leaves there's lots of different species so I'm sure different ones work different don't cut your fingers buddy but um, I have and since they're real tough and rough they have sort of an abrasive scrubby quality to them so they don't lather up nearly as well as the root, but if you just take the leaves, then you don't have to kill the whole plant. Now, now we're supposed to be talking about food, though, and this is spring food, so we could... Hi, guy. You're right in front of the camera, son. So we could dig it up and get the root, and you don't eat the root fresh. It requires a lot of boiling. 
and I really had every intention of taking these but I just can't they're just so beautiful so sorry I'm not gonna demonstrate it I don't want to hurt my little babies this is sheep sorrel and I didn't think that we were gonna have these yet but we did so good uh, sheep sorrel has I think the word is hastate, a hastate leaf. Oh, here's a little tiny one. But it's it's a little sword shape. See it has the little it has a, the length of the sword and the little the little side little guards. And when I was a kid I would take these and I would strip the, the seeds off and pretend it was that uh, magic powder from that Legend of Zelda a link to the past video game. I guess apparently I still do that, because I'm doing it right now. Um, but you can eat the leaves off of these raw or cooked. They do have some oxalic acid, so same cautions as with the other plants with those, the yellow dock, um, wood sorrel or oxalis, uh, things like that. But they have a nice little lemony taste. It's a very pleasant, mm, a very pleasant taste. Raw or cooked. This is a little volunteer sassafras tree that has come up in my yard. And it's so little that I'm not going to pull the leaves off of it. I'm going to let it grow. I'd love for it to grow here. But um, sassafras is used for sp uh, spicing things up. It's, it's uh, using gumbo sometimes. Uh, the roots are used to make a, uh, a root beer type of drink. And um, the ways you can tell what it is, it has these three different leaves all on the same plant. It'll have ones that are just an entire leaf with no lobes. It'll have them with one lobe. You can call that a mitten. It's like a thumb and then the finger part. And it can be right or left handed. And then it'll have some that have uh, three total lobes. So like, like your fingers and then a, a pinky and a thumb. And they'll all be on the same plant. And uh, not many other trees will do that. Let's see, a uh, mulberry can do stuff like that. But um, the the other way is you just you get one of the leaves and I'm gonna I'm gonna let this guy grow because he's so young, but get one of the leaves and and chew it or, or crush it up and smell it. Very distinctive sassafras taste. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> oh, look here, violets. Um, any of the wild violets are fine. African violets are a different thing entirely, so not those. But any of the wild violets, you can look how the the flower uh, kind of comes back up out of the stem, kind of like a little, uh, what do they call that, a spur? And it'll have five petals, and the bottom petal usually has um, some darker uh, veins or lines going back in there. And the flowers are edible, the leaves are edible, and you can eat them raw. Um, and they have a, actually a really nice mild taste. Um, when they get older, they may get a little bitter, but it's they're very nice, especially young. And they have a... Uh, a soup thickening property so you can make a, a okra-less gumbo if that's not sacrilegious to you <laughs> it'll thicken it up or, or other stews and soups you put okra and violets in a gumbo you're gonna be eating that thing with a fork um, but yeah so a lot of uh, mucilaginous quality very soothing in that way and also a lot of vitamin C in violets yeah a whole bunch of it and here is a little pine tree hey little guy Let's not forget pine trees. They're very edible. Uh, for this one, well, hey, gorgeous, look at the top of you. Look at that, beautiful. Um, I'm just gonna take some needles, pardon me, and thank you very much for your donation. And just this much, just to make a nice tea. Lots of vitamin C in there. You can chew them and spit out the pulp, um, or uh, just put them in hot water, steep it, make a tea. It has antiviral properties, too. Um, the seeds of the pine cone are edible. The inner bark is edible, the pollen is edible, and it's uh, um, an androgen. It has testosterone-like properties for the body. So, um, yeah, just you put a, you can put like a bag over the ends of the branches and then turn the branch over and shake it to drop the pollen out of the bag and collect it that way. But uh, we'll just use the needles right now. Let's make a, let's make a lemon balm and wild oregano or a uh, bee balm tea. Lemon balm and bee balm. Double balm. Double, double balm.
Well, would you look at that? We're just about to a feature length film and we haven't got to see examples of how to prepare a lot of these and there are so many plants that I haven't had time for like Nandina, uh, Pyracantha, the wild blueberries and their kins. Uh, some of them will have uh, berries out well, a little later. You can eat their leaves anyway. Um, the strawberries, the wild strawberries, the mock strawberries, horsetail, burdock. I guess burdock's not doing very much this early in the spring, but there are so many things out there. But you know, I'm just one man. I can only do so much. So I'm going to take a little break. Just remember, there's plenty of food out there. You just got to keep your eyes open. Go ahead and get some practice. Try some different things. If you don't like a plant one way, remember, you can try it all different kinds of ways. A lot of the uh, success or failure in this is just being willing to try again to prepare your plants a different way and experiment until you do find the way that you like them. And then there you go. So get out in the woods, get out in the fields, any place that hadn't been sprayed with pesticides and where you can still say stay six feet away from somebody else so we don't transmit diseases. And I will see you in another video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it's been helpful. Happy foraging.